You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. I'm Alex Rodriguez. And I'm Jason Kelly. From Bloomberg, this is The Deal. Each week, you will hear us in conversation with business icons. This show will explore deal-making across sports, media, and entertainment. That is a harsh lesson in business. Sports is not and, as uh, simple you know, I, as bringing a bunch of big names together. I didn't want to do another stomp you out speech. It opened so, up so many you know, more doors. The show is called The, the deal. deal. Listen to The Deal. Listen to The Deal on Spotify. With threats to our nation waiting around every corner, adaptability is more important than ever. When conditions change without notice, quick strategic thinking is crucial. And with obstacles consistently impending, determination is essential in overcoming them. It's this willingness, decisiveness, and resilience that sets Marines apart. With our fighting spirit, we don't just fight battles, we win them. Marines are the constant our nation counts on to fight the unknown. And through adaptable problem solving, we do just that. Learn more at Marines.com. You, you feel this, this nervousness on the phone there? Sir, I've been trying to make an urgent phone call up there. I don't think it's something I want to do on an overseas phone. You got to make some phone calls. Hang up the phone. Prank call. Prank call. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Packernet After Dark. This is the call-in show of the Packernet Podcast Network. If you'd like to call in, if you'd like to participate in the show, please feel free to do so. The phone number here is 608-501-0718. New callers go directly to the front of the line. We don't have any new callers today, but uh, we do have Andy from Kansas, so uh, let's see what he's all about. Hey, Ryan, this is Andy, uh, still stuck in Kansas. What up? Um, when we were on our trip up north last week, had a chance to listen to one of the podcasts about you talking how just because it's an unknown, it doesn't mean it's a negative when it comes to looking at our roster and predicting which, you know, the unpredictable, obviously, the next season. Uh, I want to thank you for that. And possibly related to that, when people talk about the change on the roster, we often time, or too often, you know, make it so-called simplistic, but it's not very accurate. When we say things like, uh, oh, we're losing this guy. Um, so, you know, we're not going to, we're not going to have this person in this position, whether it be the change of the defensive line or the wide receiver core. Yep. I mean, every um, every positional group goes through some sort of rebuild, so to speak, <laughs> on a yearly basis. It's not not a team philosophy or, or a complete roster overhaul, but, you know, things change, people injured, come back, and so on. But what I'm really wondering is, is, is there a better way to look at who we lost and who we replaced them with not saying their name, but really talking about the specific skills and talents that we've either seen or um, it's been, you know, seen on film maybe for a younger player who played a lot more in college. So, for example, the defensive line, right? We're losing uh, Jaron Reed and Dean Lowry. But what skills did they have that we're losing? Yeah. And then we're replacing them with more T.J. Slayton <clears throat> and Devontae Wyatt. Um but what skills do those guys have? So what are the skills being lost and the skills being replaced? I think that's a better way to describe how the roster is actually changing. But if you'd be willing to take up you know, one of the positional groups and, and maybe go through that, that might be interesting. Thanks. Bye. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, a great point for a couple different reasons. Number one, like you said, there's always talk about, well, you lost. Well, you lost, you lost, you lost. And, and teams do that same thing with additions. I got upset the other day when somebody was talking up the Bears and everything that they had done, and they're like, oh, they added so many people, and they're going through this list of people that are useless. I mean, like, the top player on the entire list was Robert Tunyon. Obviously, they've they've added better players, but they go down this list of, of you know, it's not just these guys, but, oh, man, they added this and this and this. It's just a name, dude. Again, I keep coming back to it, but it reminds me of when you play fantasy football, and maybe you don't have people like this in your league, but I'm sure you do because every league I've ever been in, there's somebody that's like this. They try to get your number one player by packaging seven useless players, and they actually want to convince you or think that you're going to be convinced into doing that. Like, yeah, but if you add it up, bro, first of all, I can't play all these guys. Second of all, I'm going to end up playing none of these guys. You're an idiot. I'm not doing the trade. Get out of my life forever. So yeah, you can't just say, well, look, the Packers lost Lazard. They lost... uh Randall Cobb. They lost Robert Tunyon. They lost, they lost, they lost. And, you know, 
okay, but then what did they add? And, you know, that is a, an interesting twist you put on it, and I think it makes sense. Because, again, I could sit here and say, well, yeah, we lost Lazard, but we ended, a- added Watson. Now we can get into this little pissing match about, well, well, you don't know, I mean, Watson's not even that good. He had a fluke, and da-da-da. Lazard was a proven... Da- Listen, look at... And you said pick a position group. I'm going to go with wide receiver. Look at the construction of the wide receiver group. I don't know that the rookies that we got are going to be better necessarily, although I'm relatively comfortable. And yes, if you go all the way back to Devontae, that becomes a much tougher sell. But let's just look at the construction of it. Because what we had in the past never really made a ton of sense. Especially if you just look at last year. It was a hodgepodge of just trying to put something together. But the core group was, I guess, Sammy Watkins, who was sort of a failed ex-receiver... Lazard, who is like a hybrid tight end wide receiver, that's a blocker slash, you know, big body person. Randall Cobb, who is, I don't mean this to be disrespectful, but to some degree sort of a washed up slot receiver. And so when you look at the talents, you know, if you say we replaced Lazard with Watson, it's not just number one for number one. We replaced a uh, a, a small tight end with a legit deep threat speed receiver. And so I I genuinely just like the construction of it. Whether or not these guys are going to end up reaching their full potential, I don't know. But when you look at the different pieces, you know, back a couple years ago when we had Devontae, that was freaking awesome. But to some degree, it was like, you know, having a Corvette engine on a car with bicycle tires. You know, I mean, it's, it's not the whole thing that works. It's just we've got this one really awesome thing. I feel like what we have now is, is a group that makes sense. The three guys each have have different and complementary strengths, with Christian Watson being the boundary speed threat that stretches the defense. Romeo Dobbs is sort of your underneath route runner. Jaden Reed is more of your slot receiver slash, you know, he's, he's got the speed and the movement and, and a great yard after the catch ability. And so, and, and I think it makes sense because if you look at it, the Packers never went out and drafted Alan Lazard in the second round because he was a critical piece. They picked the guy up. And he ended up being better than they thought, and so he got to keep his job. Randall Cobb was brought back only because Rodgers wanted him. Sammy Watkins was brought in because we were in kind of dire sp- straits after losing Devontae, and we're just sc- scraping along trying to find something. On the off chance Lazard doesn't pan out, maybe this guy can pan out, I don't know. But there was never a, let's just take a step back and build a wide receiver room. What does it look like? Do you want to know what it looks like? It looks like Watson, Dobbs, and Reed. You know how I know? Because the Packers just drafted this group in the last two years. This is Brian Gutekun sitting down and saying, let's actually take the time to build the receiver group that we want. And you could say the same thing with tight ends, right? We brought in Mercedes Lewis. It's not a bad thing, but it was a, it was a way to kind of get something that we didn't have. Robert Tunyon was another guy that was never really drafted to, to come in and be this prototypical. He, he just, he, kind of surprised and it was like okay i guess he's he's good so let's push him out there but deguaro was drafted and it was very obvious to see why and again he never really reached his full potential i I fingers crossed that he figures it out this year and has a bigger role and all that stuff but if you want to know what matt lafleur and brian gutekunst envision for this team you're seeing it now Jordan Love is the vision at quarterback. Musgrave, Kraft, and DeGuara is the vision at tight end. Watson, Dobbs, and Reed is the vision at wide receiver. This is the vision for this offense. But anyways, hopefully that kind of touched on what you were getting at. appreciate the call. Thank you so much. Timmy. Hey, Ryan. Peck daddy. Timmy. Peck daddy. Timmy. I'm... I haven't seen Lil Wayne in a while. Yeah. I'm really excited about so, uh, him at the draft. When I was like talking about how I wanted to address things on your show, the first thing I, ta- I thought about was Lil Wayne and the draft coming. And I love it when he like stands up to Skip Bayless. And uh, speaking uh, SB, Skip Bayless, I think he's on the love train. I think he actually believes in him. Not that, not that I believe in all that nonsense, but uh, he gets a little money on the show. Dakota, you did an awesome job bringing it. I share your enthusiasm about the team. I also think they're going to be really good. I've been on the love train ever since the Niners playoff loss two years ago. I thought that's when the love era should begin. And Dakota absolutely had, like, the best call lately. So much energy. I share, I share his enthusiasm. 
Uh, Ryan, I got a new Blackstone, Blackstone um, 28-inch griddle, nice. propane grill. It's pretty sweet. I've cooked on it twice. There's, like, so many, like, layers of seasoning on it. First time I used it was uh, Father's Day. I cooked burgers for the family. Mm. And uh, tonight I cooked um, chicken with Texas garlic toast and some diced Brussels sprouts. It's pretty sweet. All right. Um, it's really fun, like, flipping all the stuff with the flippers. Um, I'm notoriously bad at mistiming all of my, like, plating the food. Yeah. You're, like, not having stuff ready on oh, time. I'm, I'm bad. And with a flat top griddle, you can manage the heat really well. And oh, yeah. it's good for people who, like, flip stuff constantly because you kind of have to so it doesn't stick. There's a band called Love <laughs> from the 60s, and they have a song off the 67 album called Forever Changes. The song is called You Set the Scene. Okay. And I just listened to it. It's really retro. And what else is more retro than rolling it back, you know, with a third time Hall of Famer? It also has some um, appropriate lines in it. So I'd really appreciate a listen. All right. You can do that. Joe the janitor. You gotta stop going around punching people. <laughs> I don't know if it proves that you're more real or fake when you're talking about punching people when you went away for that. I think we all want you to, like, stay on the airwaves. Don't. I was so close to getting his last couple seconds in there. And also, it would have been nice if I could have got a, you know, a denier or, or one, of, one of the two. Um, I, I just haven't got to use my spreadsheet in a while, so that's all I'm saying. So if you guys, if you guys want to... Cast a vote for something, that'd be great. Let's get to uh, You Set the Scene by Love. This summer, this is try a any special Pepsi mar- commercial. <laughs> Freaking stupid idiot YouTube. All right, let's try it again. Where are you walking? I've seen you walking past. Before Walk down your doorstep You'll take some more steps What did you take them for? There's a private in my boat And he wears this instead of medals On his coat There's a chicken in my nest And she won't play until I've given her my best Alright, so... Perusing the lyrics as it's going along, I, I do understand that love is in the it's in, it's in the name or is the you know name of the band. But I had to allow that last line to get in there just to kind of uh, bring home the point that I don't know that this is the best anthem. If that's what we're even going for, maybe you just wanted to play a random thing. I don't. I'm, maybe I missed that. But let's run through it a little little bit real quick. Where are you walking? I've seen you walking. Have you been there before? Walk down your doorstep. You'll take some more steps. What did you take them for? There's a private in my boat, and he wears pins instead of medals in his coat. There's a chicken in my nest, and she won't lay until I've given her my best. Careful. At her request, she asks for nothing. You get nothing in return. If you want, she brings you water. If you don't, then you will burn. (sighs) I'm tempted to ask what the heck we're talking about here. But they're very obviously high on drugs. And they're, they're consumer base is people tripping on acid and shrooms. I think, wasn't it, it might be fake, I'm not sure, but there was a thing I saw recently that the Beatles songs were kind of nonsense on purpose. Like Yellow Submarine or whatever is just like random garbledy nonsense. Never really had a meaning, never was intended to have a meaning. I feel like that's what we're dealing with here. But, um, yeah, I mean, we'll we'll uh, we'll consider that as an option. Yo, it's Jimmy. Um, Jimmy! I want to weigh in on this burger thing. Um, I think, first of all, I want to say that think maybe if we all weigh in on our burger stuff, we can come up with the perfect burger. Because like think it. maybe we all have different like pa- areas of passion when it comes to what makes a burger the right burger. Um, I want to just speak to the seasonings. I have found that the key to a good burger is the stuff I put in the meat before I form it. Um, and 
uh, actually, pre before you even get into the seasonings, I just want to mention breadcrumbs and egg. I like to put an egg in there. I like to put some breadcrumbs in there. And seasoning wise, I think the secret is onion powder. Okay. Uh, I do like the salt and pepper and garlic, but I like to throw a bunch of onion powder in there too. Oh, also Worcestershire sauce. Wow. That uh, really, really helps. Um, and uh, if I'm feeling frisky, I might throw some double mustard seed in there um, just to give it a little something extra. So, um, yeah, just wanted to contribute uh, that to the burger condo. Jimmy out. So, um, although I did say don't just buy ground beef if you want to make burgers, that's not the best thing. That's generally what I do do because, you know, I'm cheap and whatnot. Plus, Walmart has 10-pound logs of ground beef, and I just feel like that's something I need to do because it's freaking awesome. Plus, me and the kids gather around and just smack it, which is fun. you got to smack meat, otherwise what the heck is the point? <clears throat> Eating it, I guess. But um, point is, I have a ton of ground beef, and um, enough that it's not like a steak where somebody gave me some really what I would consider over the top suggestions. I'd be like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not messing up the steak. Sorry. It's rare enough for me to eat a steak. Then I'm going to just do it the way that I think is right. But for burgers, yeah, I'll do it. Especially since I make lots of quantities anyways, I'll make one your way. In fact, if you want, shoot me some more specifics. If you want to text me or hit me up on Twitter or whatever, in terms of, you said one egg, how much breadcrumb are we doing? Worcestershire sauce? How much am I just putting a dash? Mustard? I mean, I'll do the whole shebang. I, and I'll be honest, I don't think I'm going to like it. Primarily because I'm, it's just not what I'm used to. And I think for, for me, for burgers, a lot of it is nostalgia. Which is why I just love the taste of like a charcoal burger. And I really like the taste of the meat. And And you're also going to have a hard time... I think with me in altering it, because a lot of people, they put so much crap on their burger, you can't taste the burger as much. So you putting a ton of stuff in it is probably going to enhance it so you can taste it a little more. I do just burger and cheese. And so if I'm putting egg and Worcestershire and breadcrumbs and mustard seed, I'm going to taste that. And I'm probably not going to want to. But I'm intrigued. And onion powder. And since I've been on a, a massive cooking kick, it's nice to actually have all this stuff. Like I've got bunch of different kinds of mustard used to not like mustard i'm really coming around to mustard in a big way worcestershire sauce i, I don't even know if we have that we should have that but i i don't use it <laughs> so if i don't i'll grab some got onion powder got breadcrumbs got eggs and i got uh, ground beef thawing in the fridge right now because that's what you have to do when you buy 10 pounds you hack it up put it in your freezer and take it out a little bits at a time but i will try that and i will report back and again if you want to be more specific let me know otherwise i'm just going to wing it What's up, Brian? This what is Blake's dad. How you doing? Hey, just calling to say about two weeks ago, I deleted my Twitter. I got off the podcast for a little bit. Just kind of took a break from all phone and devices and whatnot. I get so, it. I got no idea what's been going on, really. Um, I got the Packers app, so I've kind of been watching some videos and whatnot. But, uh, yeah, just no more Twitter for me. It got really annoying. I was on it way too much. Um, but I'm back listening to the podcast, so just calling to say hello again. Later. Well, I get it. I think I need to probably do the same thing. I, I, I keep telling myself, you need to just be a consumer of Twitter, right? Just go on there and look at it. You don't have to interact with it. You don't have to say anything. You don't have to comment. You don't need to respond. Just read it. If you see something interesting, mark it down. Don't put it on Twitter. Just put it on the podcast. And then I come on here and I can't do it. So either I'm going to learn to shut my mouth and just be a consumer, or I'm going to have to get away from it for a little bit. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll go back. I'll get off Twitter and go back to Facebook. I doubt that's better, but who knows? Maybe things have changed over on the Facebooks. Brian, Kyle hey. from Madison. So How you doing? Good. Good, good. good. Yep. All yep. right. You'll love this. You'll love this. I'm getting married uh, next Sunday. Hey, congrats. Thank you. You're welcome. And so we're getting married in like this venue, barn venue. Okay. And we're doing, I decided just to lean into the kind of the barn thing. Yeah. So we're doing barbecue. Yeah. There's this place in Madison called Smokey John. Okay. Won some awards. Not sure about that. And a new guy just took it over after like 30 years. The previous owner passed away. So we definitely wanted to get him some business. So we're having him cater the wedding and we're doing 
like the nice slow cooked beef brisket with a mm. like a more of a tangy barbecue. Okay. And then we're doing the baby back pork ribs with a spicy, sweet and spicy, and then some oven roasted barbecue chicken with all all the fixings and the cornbread and the coleslaw and the the whole the whole thing. And then, man, I don't know like. Did you do a wedding cake when you got married? Yes. I was looking at wedding cakes, right? First of all, they're like a million dollars. But also, we were tasting some, man. They don't, they're kind of garbage. Like all that fondant. Bro, so here's the deal. <clears throat> we didn't get like a traditional wedding cake. We didn't do hardly anything traditional. We actually got a relatively low cost wedding, which is great. In my mind, it was still way too expensive. My wife's all proud that we had the cheapest wedding in history, which is probably true. But in my mind, way too expensive. Anyways. We didn't get that whole massive thing. Uh, we got our cake, because my wife, she doesn't like like birthday cake, but she loves cheesecake. It's like her favorite thing in the world, and who could argue with that? Cheesecake is amazing. So we got ours from, um, just going to go ahead and plug a business here. It's something to check out. It's on the other side over there in Milwaukee, but it's over at Simma's Bakery. And I remember, I, I don't even remember how this came to be. I think my wife went in for a tasting. And I just met her like in the parking lot outside or something. I don't know why. If I was like, it was after work or whatever, I don't know. But she had like these cakes on her trunk. And I just went up and we were just sitting there eating cake. It was dope. And I don't know if it was like from different places or if it was just all from Simmas or what. But dude, I, I, I tried it and it is, I think I've had it like twice in my life. One, there's a place in Illinois, I think that does the kind of the same thing. I'm pretty sure because I, I I know it was like the best thing I ever had. And then I had this one and I was like, dude, this is it. This is what I've been searching for my entire life. Um, but if if you happen to be heading out that way, I don't want you to make a special trip and then you hate it. Plus, if your wife like wants this massive thing, which maybe they do massive things. Let me let me let me do some homework for you here, bro. Because you gotta have a good wedding cake. Boom, wedding cakes. All right, let's see. We'll work with you to design the perfect wedding cake. We welcome suggestions. Blah blah blah. If you wish to order a tiered wedding cake, we ask you please call and make an appointment. Yeah, so so you can get this super dope cake. All right, yeah, so they, they got a bunch of different options. They got their classic cheesecake, which is the way you should go, but maybe you won't like it, I don't know. But then they got uh, Genoese cake, marble cake with raspberry, mar marble, different marble cake, chocolate cake, carrot cake, different thing cake, red velvet cake, whatever. So, I, I mean, maybe you don't have to if you don't want to. I'm not going to make you drive all the way to Milwaukee for, for whatever, but if you guys are already putting in a ton of work and you want a cake that doesn't taste like, you know, armpit call up simma's bakery tell them you want to set up a, a tasting or whatever and they'll just let you sample all these different things and it's freaking dope man my recommendation or just get the uh, armpit cake no big deal to be honest i was so nervous on my wedding day. i'm still mad about this i didn't eat hardly any of the food i was such a freaking emotional wreck even afterwards when i was like you know all come down from like having to stand up there and do the whole thing Still couldn't really eat. The food was amazing. We had some like Italian food. They had chicken parmesan. So I had that. And then it was like, I didn't even, I didn't even touch the dessert table, which is infuriating. I would love to go back in time and just destroy that dessert table. And then we had the wedding cake and it was like, we did the whole cutting the cake thing. My wife wouldn't let me smash it in her face, which is lame, but whatever. Almost did it anyways, but it was a wise move not to. I took one bite. It was amazing, but I literally, for, as somebody who has spent his entire life hurting himself with food, I could not do it. I just couldn't do it, and it was the saddest thing in the world. But I'm obsessed with it, man. I'm I'm ready to just drive over there. Maybe I'll meet you there and just be like, yeah, I'm the best man, and like we could just eat cake. My your wife might not like that so much, but I'll come hang out and eat. I'll eat cake with you. <laughs> Anyways, man, congratulations. Glad to hear that uh, that's coming up. And there might be stuff similar to that in um, Madison. Maybe the key is just look for wedding cheesecakes. I don't know. Do whatever you want, man, or do whatever she wants. Actually, would be smarter. That they de they decorate it with, man. This stuff looks cool, but it doesn't. It tastes like no. It's paste. garbage. Right. It's garbage. So I said the hell with that, and we're doing. Uh, we found a cupcake baker. Oh. We're just getting all these filled cupcakes instead of. I spent all that time, and you already finished it. I gotta let you guys finish before I go on my thing. All right. No cupcakes are good. Uh, uh, instead of a cake. So I thought you. I thought you'd like that. I do but, appreciate uh, that. Also, That's good. my nephew's in town. Yeah, he's from Germany. He's, he's gonna be eleven. Nice. And he's been asking me all about, you know, when I wear a Packer shirt. He's like, what's, you know, what's that about? Tell me about your team. So we've been watching highlights. Yeah. So I'm, I'm really happy to report I have converted another person to the light side. Love it. He is now a huge Packer fan. He's learning about the sport. So yep. it's, it's been really cool. So 
spreading the gospel of Green Bay and Love barbecue it. weddings. It's it's there's some good decision making going on uh, this week at least. Take care. Well, if you change your mind and you want to go eat cake, let me know. I'll eat your cake. <laughs> no, that sounds awesome though, dude. Barbecue and and delicious cupcakes, man. That's the way to go. Also, I did look up that um, that barbecue place. I've not tried it, but I remember. I remember that being there and, and thinking, I got to try that sometime, and I do. I need to try that sometime. Faux show. Hey, it's Chris from Green Bay. What up? Uh, just was listening to the debate about Fleet Farm and Home Depot. I thought I'd get in on the action a little bit here. Right. Um, I'd like to see Home Depot with all the greatest peach rings in the world. Fleet Farm's notorious for having great sweets and great candy you walk in there you have to walk out with at least a bag or two of, of gummy worms or uh burnt peanuts and they got a huge selection of some great stuff over there but man oh, they got some good peach rings so i gotta say it is funny to me when when people get you know have these conversations about um, Quick Trip isn't the best example because, I mean, you don't just go to a gas station for gas generally. In fact, we almost never go to Quick Trip for the purpose of gas once every 15 Quick Trip trips. But it's like, you talk about, what was that, Bucky's or Buckeyes or whatever? It's like, dude, you got to check out this gas station. They got this guy that dresses up in a costume. and it, It's never something that, like, sells me. It's always just this thing that obviously people love it because it's, I don't know, it's just, it must just be a great experience. Because, again, I don't really know. Fleet Farm might be amazing. I, but for me, it's like, all right, so it's like a hardware store. Is it cheaper, or do they have a wider selection? Like, is there a grilling selection? Like, they got a bunch, like, Ace Hardware, they got a ton of grilling stuff, sauces and rubs and everything else. And it's like, well, what they got, they got these peach rings, bro. And they got snacks. Like, snacks. You like snacks? I bet you like snacks. Like, <laughs> snacks. Cool, I, I guess. I don't know. Is that is that what we do? When we, we, we make a trip out to Fleet Farm for peach rings? I mean, I'm not trying to disparage it. If you're going there to get some garden shears and you just happen to have a hankering for peach rings, which I didn't know was a thing. I've had probably six peach rings in my life. Then, um, yeah, for sure. But it is just funny, the, the random things that everyone will have an allegiance for. I mean, I, I guess I understand it. People listen to this show because of a cricket that died in my basement like three years ago. And an alarm that used to interrupt my show all the time. So, <laughs> I guess I get it. Anyways, why don't we take a quick break? Uh, we'll be right back. Hey, U.S. Cellular customers, I've got good news, so don't hit skip forward just yet. I'm talking about their special customer event, Us Days. What's Us Days? It means exclusive offers just for their customers, just to say thanks, like up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. No, I didn't just misread that. That's up to $1,200 off. They must really like you. Us Days at U.S. Cellular. Exclusive offers just for you, just to say thanks. Right now, U.S. Cellular customers get up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. Terms apply. I'm Alex Rodriguez. And I'm Jason Kelly. From Bloomberg, this is The Deal. Each week, you're here in conversation with business icons. This show will explore deal making across sports, media, and entertainment. That is a harsh lesson in business. Sports is and not and, as uh, simple you know, as bringing a bunch of big names together. I didn't want to do another stomp you out speech. It opened so, up so many more know, doors. The show is called The, the deal. deal. Listen to the deal. Listen to the deal on Spotify. Hey, it's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo concert in Kansas City, go Kevin! Or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda. You never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price. Priceline. Hey, Ryan. Hey. What's up, bud? It's Joe, the janitor. Hey, Joe, the janitor. Um, and I hate the bears. Oh, Anyway, um, uh, been listening to the podcast. Uh, I think right now we got a tally of two to one. So, uh, me being the truther. All right. But anyway, um, so I haven't been able to call for a couple of days. I'm pretty busy. 
this temp agency uh, that I'm working for, um, they actually found another job for me, which I'm surprised after smacking the shit out of that kid. Um, that they still wanted me to work. I guess I must have done a good job on that, uh, that bang up painting job I did. Yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, they sent me to a whole different type of a job now because I guess I'm unable to work with that millennial bastard. Or, sorry, Gen Z bastard. Um, but they got me installing a metal roof up in, uh, Boston. And the guys I'm with are actually cool and they speak English. Um, so yeah, just, a, just an update of what I'm called in a little bit. Hopefully all's well and, um, uh, I'll call back soon. Uh, I got to finish building this damn roof. Uh, Joe the roofer signing off. Shalom. Well, we always appreciate uh, the updates, Joe, and I will be honest, I'm kind of stunned. We have got um, three truthers. We got Bramble, Aaron, and Joe the janitor, Kyle from Madison being the only denier. I have to assume at least somebody took a firm step in the denier column after that call, but I don't know. I don't know. Who knows these things? Hey, Ryan. Hey. What's going on? What up? Seth, driving home from... Uh on a little trout fishing three day weekend kind of thing. So. Sounds good. Sounds good. A um, couple things. Um, first, we were talking about who Kevin is in the office, and I'm still catching up because I was out of service for a couple days. So, okay. hopefully, no one else said this, but I think it's got to be Tyler Davis because just like they you know, do Kevin's work and try to make him feel good, and you know, they all love him even though maybe he's not the best. I feel like that's the same way the coaching staff treats Tyler Davis. So that's my pick for Kevin. Um, Sweet Farm. Dang, would you uh, pause? Jeez, I got my mouse not on the mouse pad, and it's just like, uh, you want to move? No, I just want to click, stupid. So I, I, I'm not 100% on board with that, but one funny part that's absolutely true was um, when Michael described how he hired Kevin. And he was saying that Kevin applied for a job in the warehouse, and he's like, I don't know, I just saw something in him, and he made him an accountant. <laughs> that that very much reminds me of how the Packers treat Tyler Davis. I don't know, there's just something about him. He's just really, really good. So that that could work. Versus Home Depot? Yeah. So I live in Iowa, so I assume they're relatively consistent since they're chain stores, you know, regardless of state or city or whatever. Yeah. But it depends on what I'm shopping for and which one I go to. If I need grill stuff, I'm going to Home Depot. Right, if I need, I need home repair stuff, whether it's, you know, uh, paint or maybe paint's a bad example, but sometimes I get it from there. But, you know, drill bits, uh, nails, screws, plumbing stuff, right. um, I'm going to Home Depot. But if I need fishing stuff... Oh, okay. Anything outdoor stuff, I'm going to Mills. Got it. Uh, Fleet Farm. You guys call Fleet Farm. We don't call Mills around here. Maybe, I assume this is the same thing, but maybe not. Um, Anyways, I think that's all I got for now. I'll talk to you later. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I kind of thought of it that way. I don't know why. Again, I've been into like two of them in my life, but it just, it kind of had like a, for some reason in my mind, it has more of an outdoorsy feel to it. I don't know. But okay, fair enough. Seth, what's going on? Hey, Ryan, it's Seth again. Hello. Uh, I meant to say one more thing about the office on mm-hmm. my last call. I even had time and I didn't get it in. Um, anyways, are we allowed to use past Packers players or coaches sure. for office characters? This is fake anyways. Um, I'm going to hope you said yes, because yep. I'm going to give <laughs> one. I actually think Jim is Devante. Everybody loves him. He's good at his job. And uh, I know Devontae works really hard, but, like, he kind of looks like he's hardly trying sometimes because that's how good he is. And yeah. that's how I uh, that's how I think Jim is, too. So, anyways, I think uh, Devontae is Jim. I'm trying to think about who Pam might be. You know, of course, you got to – she's a girl, and Packers are pretty much all guys, but uh, other than, like, a couple trainers or whatever. But just her personality, I don't know. I'll keep thinking. Maybe you already said that and I missed it. Like I said, I'm catching up on the podcast, but okay. I'm rambling. Bye. The only issue with that, even though, again, everything you said makes sense, 
Dwight was the best salesman. So if Jim is Devante, who the heck is Dwight? I don't know. And I hate to say Dwight is Devante, but, you know, if we're just talking about the absolute best, there you go. I don't know. None of this stuff is perfect or real. Hey, Ryan, it's Chris again. Hey. From Green, from Green Bay. Yeah. Uh, and they're very, they have, Flea Farm has your very own <laughs> line of licorice. Okay. If you're looking for, if you're looking to satisfy the sweet tooth, you got to try the okay. licorice. <laughs> got a jumbo and a normal. Both are great. All right. But give them a try. I would travel to Flea Farm just for that. Home Depot's got nothing on Fleet Farm. All right. Got it. Candy. So, yeah, I'm, I'm not a massive candy person, to be honest. Um, I mean, candy's fine. It, I'm not trying to give you a food hot take where I don't think candy is good. It's just I, I don't have any interest in generally eating it. I, I Chocolates are good. You know, like we talk about candy bars and Milky Ways and all that. But, like, peach rings and licorice. I mean, that's the kind of stuff that it's low enough on the food chain, in my opinion, where there's been a bag of licorice sitting upstairs. I haven't touched it. Pretty much anything just sitting up on that counter, I'm going to grab it. Crackers. I just made a peach cobbler. I can't even... I forbid myself from going into the kitchen because every time I'm just going to grab a spoon and scoop it and eat it. So I can't even go in the kitchen. I don't know why I made it. My wife went to the peach truck. I got excited. I'm like, dude, I can't wait. Doing the cobbler. I made it. And now it's just sitting there. So now I don't know what to do. You could have rolls sitting there. I'd, I'd grab a roll, just slap some butter on it, and just eat it as I'm walking past. I mean, you know, peanuts, chips, pretzels, but, you know, you put suckers or Jolly Ranchers or gummy bears. Maybe maybe I'll grab some gummy bears, but I don't know. I just, it doesn't, uh, doesn't super do it for me. But if somebody came along like you and said that they have some unique, amazing version, I would try it for the sake of trying it. That's, that's true. Hey, Ryan. Hey, Ron from Eau Claire, Wisconsin, calling back. What Thanks up? again. Third time calling. Um, I wanted to add to the Colin Cowherd discussion. Uh, the first time I ever heard Colin Cowherd's show, it was uh, on the radio. He was talking about music, the favorite music of his uh, his daughter, how his, his daughter loves Taylor Swift. And he was like going on this whole 15 minute diatribe on uh, how everyone always says Radiohead is the greatest band, but you know, my daughter likes Taylor Swift. I mean, she, you know, that's just as good. Right. And it was just so funny because he was going off and like, I'm a musician professionally. So um, I can say, yeah, at least within people that I know, Radiohead is seen as, uh, one of the most artistically accomplished hmm. rock bands Didn't know there are. And um, and it was just funny to see him, like, he was almost bashing Radiohead for being so weird and artsy. And so I think really what it comes down to, what, what that tells me is that I think Colin Cowherd is more of a, um, he, he's more interested in what's most popular to people. So yeah. I've heard him talk a lot about, like certain franchises are, are more uh, lucrative uh, when they're aired on TV and stuff like that. Um, he seems to be a big fan of this sort of capitalist idea that whatever's most popular is what has the most societal value, um, at least from an entertainment perspective. So that was an interesting thing, but I, part of me was like, Man, can't you stay in your own lane? You're not a musician. Don't go off trashing Radiohead. Um, and again, I, don't, I have nothing against Taylor Swift at all. I just, it was just funny to compare the two. Like, what are you even talking about? So, uh, anyways, I, uh, will, I will also contribute to the annoyance with, uh, Mr. Coward. All right. Thanks. Well, first of all, I didn't realize that about Radiohead. Um, second of all, I think it's hilarious that no matter how you pronounce his last name, it sounds like you're just saying it as an insult, whether you're calling him coward or cowherd. It's just like, it's either way, it, it sounds like you're just saying things to be mean about him. But now you got me checking out Radiohead. Well, I think I realize I know less about Radiohead than I thought. It's just one of those bands that's like, oh yeah, I know Radiohead for sure. And it's like, well, I know Creep, and that's about it. There might be another one out there somewhere, I have no idea. But I'm I'm listening to some of these songs, I'm like, yeah, I don't... I. 
Don't know what it is. Don't want to listen to it. But even Creep, I don't really get the appeal. I know it's popular. Like a lot of people, when they do covers, they like to do Creep. I'm not trying to knock Radiohead. I'm just I'm just going off the top of my head here, realizing that I didn't uh, didn't really realize all of the things about Radiohead. But yeah, I don't I don't really know what Coward is doing. I think he. Um, I don't know. It's it's tough to to kind of nail down what the ultimate goal is. And I, and I think the biggest thing is how much of it is brilliant genius as opposed to just random whatever. You know, like did did he really go into this? Going back to, for example, the um, the Jordan Love thing with the articles. Is this some sort of a brilliant mastermind thing where he realizes um, by doing this, I could appeal to the sort of anti-Packers crowd while also getting a massive boost from Packers fans who are going to swarm this, and I'm going to deliberately make it stupid, but also at least a, a good enough soundbite, so so people that like it will like it, and people that hate it will really hate it, and it's just going to create a fight. Like, I don't know how brilliant that was, as opposed to legitimately, he just woke up in the morning, saw that article, and then just thought, you know what, I'm going in on Jordan Love. I, I've, I've, I think this is this is all I need to know, and he really thinks that what he said is profound. I really don't know. And I'm not just going to automatically give him too much credit in that he's a, a mega genius, because I think we do that far too much. And more than likely, people are just stupid and kind of stumble into stuff. Hey, Ryan, it's here. Hi. I uh, just wanted to run a couple questions by you with scenarios that concern uh, the future of Bakhtiari. Since you went in all in uh, discussing the O-line, I thought we would take it a little bit further and... Have you, uh, you know, just discuss next year's draft if Bakhtiari gets traded? We get a draft pick, obviously, for Bakhtiari. We'll be having a second or first from the Jets. Yep. And our own first round going into next year's draft. Do we draft both a left and right tackle? Keep Jenkins where he's at at left guard. Keep Tom at either right guard or as a floater, depending on who comes available in that draft. Um, or even possibly, you know, Caleb Jones at right tackle, Tom at left tackle, and then draft for development, you know, somewhere in the mid range and maybe use those other high draft picks for some other need. So I'm just curious which way you would go with that knowing that uh, this line is very young. I know that it'll be a lot easier to make those decisions after the season to see how these guys develop and everything. But uh, just kind of getting a, a peek ahead to next year's draft and seeing what potentially Green Bay could do with either if Bach stays or if Bach goes. And obviously, I think we all think that Bakhtiari will most likely be traded after this season. I'm out. Well, I definitely appreciate you asking because I know the vast majority of Packer fans don't even want to talk about the draft in like February, much less July. But as you probably know, I'm not one of those people. So as much as I would be completely fine talking about next year's draft today and a little bit almost every day, I kind of can't because nobody really wants to hear it. But since you asked, let's take a little look-see. The... the the hard part about your specific question, and it's a bit of a cop-out, but it's the only real answer, is I have no idea because I don't know how things are going to shake out, right? So we would have to look at it through different scenarios. Let's just say Jordan Love is is at least good enough that we're looking at it saying, all right, yeah, he's, he's the dude, right? We're not going to replace him. So then where is our attention? And again, we might have two first-round picks, and, and so, see, this, this is where it also gets complicated because if Jordan Love is the dude, we're not picking top 10, Right? There's a chance that we could be picking between 10 and 20. And let's just say we get that second pick from the Jets, and that's also somewhere in the 20s or so. So we've got two picks somewhere between, let's say, 15 and 25. We're probably not looking wide receiver or tight end. We're, we're saying Bakhtiari is gone, just hypothetical. Aaron Jones maybe isn't here. Then you look at the defensive line, that's tough because I think we might need a lot of help there. Although we do have Carl Brooks, Colby Wooden, I don't know how that panned out. I, if I had to guess, probably not super fantastic. And we know the Packers love trenches. Pass rush, I don't necessarily think is going to be a thing. I think we've invested, I'm not going to say enough, but you know, when you're talking first round picks, I don't know that that's going to be a thing again. Not impossible, but probably not what I'm thinking. Linebacker, same thing. 
Corner also relatively unlikely, even if you know we're kind of winding down with Razul or whatever. We still have Stokes, who I don't think we're giving up on. So safety would be kind of a big deal. All right, so if we're just looking right now at what NFL Mock Draft Database has to say, between 15 and 25, or we can even kind of go out a little bit from there. We got J.C. Latham at 13. Uh, we got a wide receiver, no. A corner, no. Michael Hall Jr., defensive lineman, maybe. Uh, corner, no. Uh, Jerzon Newton, defensive line, then a wide receiver. Then Cooper De- Dijon, safety. Braylon Trice, edge, another wide receiver. There's a lot of wide receivers. Uh, Barrett Carter, linebacker. Jeremiah Trotter, linebacker. Donovan Jackson, interior offensive line. Andrew Makuba, safety. Uh, and then we're kind of getting into... 28, 29, 30, whatever. So, look, I, I think the priority would lean offensive line. Premium position, trenches, as much as we all might look at safety as the biggest thing, offensive line makes sense. However, it's also one of those things where I feel like the Packers are looking at it going, nah, I kind of like it. You know, where we kept saying we need wide receiver, wide receiver, wide receiver, and the Packers are like, nah, I kind of like the guys we got. I don't know that they don't look at this and just go, we got Zach Tom, we got Elton, we can kick out Elton, and we can move up, whether it be Royce or Sean Ryan, or Jake Hansen, whatever. Or we could try to, you know, find somebody in the middle rounds again. So, I mean, it's it's pretty seriously tough. I mean, again, J.C. Latham, Alabama offensive tackle, stands out, not because of anything he's done. I haven't watched a single thing. There is also Joe Alt, who at one point was like the number one guy, and he's already falling, which happens all the time. You're looking like February of two drafts from now and it's like oh these are the names and then you look a few months later and it's like where did those names go but i guess another thing you could ask is is there going to be a position that we're going to want to package and move up for i don't necessarily think so unless we're talking quarterback which we're not really doing as a hypothetical right now um i mean i'm trying to think like corner you've got kool-aid mckinstry out of alabama you know is there a scenario where Razul goes bye-bye, Stokes is not the dude, or maybe his, his whole injury thing was a very serious thing, and this Kool-Aid McKinstry is just the, the, the freaking bee's knees, man? Maybe. Um, looks like there's a decent amount of edge rushers in Jared Verse, Dallas Turner, TJ Tuimolawau. Um, again, I don't think so, but maybe. What I wonder about more so would be defensive line. The Packers never seem to be at a point where they're satisfied with it. And even though, well, we've already invested so much, eh. Lucas Van Ness is an edge rusher. We did invest in Devontae Wyatt, that's true. Kenny Clark has not really been that dude in a long time, and even if he kind of turns it around, he's kind of getting up there a little bit. And after that, we got Wyatt, who is an unknown commodity, Kenny, who's kind of slipping and getting old and is very expensive, TJ Slayton is just a nose tackle, and we don't have anything else unless Carl Brooks or Colby Wooden, who are mid to late round picks, unless they show up as like real super legit guys, which I'm going to just go out on a limb and say is unlikely. I don't know that defensive tackle doesn't become kind of the priority. I know everybody's going to be mad about, no, no, we, do, we don't need that. We need safety and that. We already did that. I'm just saying. I'm just telling you. As somebody who told you last year, we're going edge, even though that's not what you want and that's not what you think. We're going either wide receiver or safety or something. So Mason Smith out of LSU sitting at 12. Uh, Michael Hall Jr. sitting at 16. Jerzon Newton, Illinois, sitting at 18. That would be probably my first thought with with tackle coming in later. And, and, you know, maybe I'm overthinking it in terms of that. You know, if Bakhtiari is leaving, who cares? Even if you really like Zach Tom, go get a tackle. You know, worst case scenario, we have too many tackles and one of them has to play guard. Aw, shucks. You know, I mean, that that really should be the mentality. If you're asking me as opposed to how I feel the Packers will handle this, that probably is the way it should be. And so it doesn't seem to be a super high-end tackle class, although there's a, a pile of names in the first round. The, the top guy so far is Olumuyiwa Fashanu, tackle out of Penn State. So, you know, is this potentially a let's trade up and get the top guy thing, or we could get lucky and the top guy ends up just kind of falling to us because, again, it's not a super top-end tackle class i don't know but just uh looking at it let's see jc latham could he be the guy he is a he's a right tackle i think if we went right tackle the first thing that would come to my if you told me right now that we were drafting a guy that was expected to be a right tackle my thought would be zach tom didn't super pan out now maybe that's stupid and they're like no no, he's just gonna play left maybe but if zach tom didn't pan out and we're sitting here looking at a team that has basically no tackles again my thought is elton goes left 
and then we draft a right. If we like Zach Tom, I think he should stay. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe he's super good. He should be our left tackle. I don't know. But if he kills it there, I would rather draft a left tackle. And yes, it's possible for a left tackle to play right and right to play left. I just, you know, it's it's certainly not a guarantee. Um, the Olumuyiwa Fashanu out of Penn State. This dude is a, he's got kind of Packer written all over him. I don't know anything about his athleticism, but if his athleticism is real high, then let's just pencil this in as our pick. First of all, he's 20 and a half years old right now. His run blocking grades were 63 and 60. His pass blocking grades were 88 and 85. Just elite, dominant, freakish, six foot six, 321 pound uh, pass blocker. And he's only ever played left tackle. That mess isn't necessarily the biggest Packers selling point, but he is a pure left tackle. So I'm kind of all over the place because I haven't even really looked at it yet and you got me excited and I'm kind of just bouncing all over the walls here. But let's just say this is going to be our pick with our first pick. Olumuyiwa Fashanu. I'm, I'm, I'm enunciating it as though I'm not saying it wrong anyways. It's not going to matter. Somebody's going to tell me that I'm wrong. And then let's just say with our second pick, uh, where's my guy here? Where's the guy from Illinois? I've, I've, be, I've grown an affinity for Illinois defensive players since their secondary yesterday. Jerzon Newton. Whoo, he had a breakout year. 58-57-92. Dang. He went from 15 pressures to 60 pressures. It was more attempts, but not that many more attempts. Good lord. Still only four sacks, but this guy was disruptive. Had almost no bad games the entire year. His lowest graded game was a 64 at Purdue. Didn't have a single game without a pressure. Um... Had multiple pressures almost every single week with the exception of week zero against Wyoming, but 10, 7, 8, 3, 4, 3, 6, 3, 2, 2, 6, 4 were his pressure numbers. I don't know, man. Something to keep an eye on. I See, now, this is what I'm doing the rest of the day. I'm going to start looking at this. I, I should just do a YouTube video. We're doing a mock draft. We're doing it. You got me excited about the draft now, man. What have you done? And, as I said, we got to, so we got to start looking at this. I'm not saying for the podcast, don't run away, but for us draft nerds, we'll hang out in our own little private corner somewhere. But we also got to start digging into 2025 because we need to be the most in-depth, educated 2025 draft aficionados that have ever existed. So anyways, I am going to leave it at that. You guys have a good rest of your night. I will talk to you later. Have a good one. Bye-bye. <laughs>